In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein declared, Of the things that can be spoken, speak with the utmost rigor, and of what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. Wittgenstein was sure that if you can get to the basis of what can be spoken, which is an elementary proposition, and express it in truth function, he would be able to solve the problem of philosophy that had been frustrating scholars for the last 2,000 years. However, a conversation with Frank Ramsey and Piero Srafa had posed a great challenge to Wittgenstein. Ramsey suggested the color exclusion problem to Wittgenstein. The red and blue are not mutually exclusive. In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein claimed that the proposition, it is red and blue at the same time, violates the logical structure of colors. Therefore, it is a logical impossibility, that is, a contradiction. Logically speaking, there can be no color that stands between the red and blue. A thing must either be red or it must be blue. In only such clarity of language can a proposition paint the picture of reality. However, according to Ramsey, seemingly simple concepts of the red and blue in fact contain profound complexity. He points out the fact that the color blue and red cannot be sustained simultaneously. For example, it is impossible to produce the color that stands in the middle of the red and green or the blue and yellow by mixing the two colors. Thus, something that is green with a red glow or yellow with a blue hue does not exist. Therefore, a proposition, it is one particular color that is found here and now and no other color is present, cannot qualify as a truth function. Thus, we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot speak with clarity, nor can we stay silent. Goethe said that when you hold a red cloth up to a bull, he becomes furious, but the philosopher only begins to rave when you start talking about color in general. On the other hand, Srafa raised the objection through the problem of Neapolitan hand gesture. In Naples, Italy, people often express their emotions through their hand gestures. For instance, brushing the underside of the chin with fingertips of one hand signals disgust or contempt. Codified gestures like this cannot be precisely translated into a written language, but can nevertheless communicate itself as signs. Ramsey and Srafa's interjection has been a revelation. Wittgenstein realized that philosophy, even within the confines of what can be spoken, cannot be completed. There is no such thing as the pure logic that would take account of all things that can be spoken. Therefore, Wittgenstein decides that he will tackle this problem in another way. This is a circumstance surrounding the birth of Wittgenstein's later philosophy, represented by philosophical investigations. To jump ahead, has Wittgenstein found the meaning of existence through his investigation? No. He gives up completing the book two years before his death because he had come to a conclusion that the search for the answer to the problem, the investigation itself, is the very meaning of existence, and there is no better answer. The best that I could write would never be more than philosophical remarks. My thoughts would soon be crippled if I try to force them in any single direction against a natural inclination. The philosophical remarks in this book are, as it were, a number of sketches of landscapes which were made in the course of these long and involved journeys. These are the words that Wittgenstein had left behind. A daring quest to find the unattainable truth. A desperate attempt to find a solution to life's complex riddles. An earnest attempt to champion human existence at all costs. When one engages in such pursuit with full effort, Nirvana can visit him for a very short moment and life's frustrations can leave him for this very short instant. In life, as well as in philosophy, the answer to the problem lies in the struggle for the answer itself. There is no such thing as the final answer. The impossibility of reducing our existence as a whole to a language speaks to the impossibility of solving the ultimate questions of philosophy through the precise language of mathematics and science. Wittgenstein thus declares, the world of physics is not the world of the everyday. Philosophical investigations begins with a quote from Augustine's Confessions. After I train my mouth to form these signs, I use them to express my desires. Only when the mouth, as the human organ that speaks, gets used to the signs, can a human being participate in the world, the world that is made of rules. We witness this in action as children learn language through their games. Human beings, before learning the rules of a language, first learn how to use it. This is the point of the investigation. When we were children, we all wanted to play the game of language that would connect ourselves to the world, freely and voluntarily. However, in the process of investigation, we run into confusion. Wittgenstein noted that, when you philosophize, the rules become blurred and this can bring about a confusion. He asks, one might say that the concept of game is a concept with blurred edges, but is a blurred concept a concept at all? Is an indistinct photograph a picture of a person at all? Is it even always an advantage to replace an indistinct picture by a sharp one? Isn't the indistinct one often exactly what we need? Can you give a sure answer to this question? You may be shaking your head. Well, we will revisit Wittgenstein's claim. The world of physics is not the world of the everyday. In the everyday world, we do not conceive the objects and the phenomena with absolute clarity. Wittgenstein claims that our investigation is directed not towards phenomena, but towards the possibilities of phenomena. This is the reason why language can be a game. It is also the reason why we get pleasure from a difficult question which has to be solved through language. We obsess over a game because of the uncertainty of the result. No one is fascinated by a game when he or she already knows who will win and who will lose. By the same logic, we get pleasure from a difficult question because we are faced with the possibility of a final answer, not a certainty. Let's look at another example. In 1937, during his last semester at Cambridge, Wittgenstein introduced his famous duck rabbit picture. Does this picture look like a rabbit or does it look like a duck? In trying to solve this problem, Wittgenstein does not aim for the absolute certainty as he would have done in the past. His friend Trier said, 
Hegel always seems to show that things that seem different are in fact the same. To this, Wittgenstein responded, But my interest is to show that the things that look the same are in fact different. Finding the universal truth amongst things that seem different from one another, or finding a difference from the things that appear the same, are all materials for philosophical investigations. However, wouldn't you agree that what gives life its vitality is to investigate the differences between you and me, or me and the rest of the world? Just like finding a rabbit and a duck in the same painting? The game of finding the possibility of difference between myself and the world and examining it. Such game of contemplation constitutes an investigation that can elevate life itself to an aesthetic dimension. We sustain the investigation through allowing the differences to come forth from the things that initially seemed identical, thus creating new rules. On July 12, 1949, Wittgenstein stops making any changes to the manuscript of philosophical investigation. However, already in January 1945, he is stating in the preface that he does not intend on finishing the book. I should have liked to produce a good book. This has not come about, but the time has passed in which I could improve it. We may say that philosophical investigations is made of pendulum swing between his hope of completing his philosophy and the realization that it cannot be completed. Suffering from the prostate cancer, Wittgenstein spent the most of his remaining life reading philosophical investigations carefully, sentence by sentence, with the most trusted disciples, referring to philosophical investigation as my book with obvious affection. Now, to bring this to an end, let's take a look at the preface to philosophical investigations once again. I make my writing public with doubtful feelings. It is not impossible that it should fall to the lot of this work in its poverty and in the darkness of this time to bring light into one brain or another, but of course it is not likely. In regard to the investigation, he's offering an answer that is open-ended, a philosophical investigation that can be a salvation for some and nirvana for the others. It means that at the moment of our death, when the time has arrived, all we'll have to show for our lives is a landscape painting which is neither finished nor unfinished. This moment, what are we searching for? Are we not trying to reach for the unattainable certainty as if though you are looking for hidden treasures? However, perhaps the real fault is to live our lives as if though there is no problem to figure it out. Perhaps that is the foolish attitude to life that we are taking today. In order to steer our course towards a greater life, we hope that you can take a step closer to what Wittgenstein has left behind. Thank you. Paper Renaissance